Welcome to part two of this Climate Chat Club interview with Kevin Anderson. I'm your host, Dan Miller. This is the second part of a two and a half hour interview with Professor Anderson that was conducted on May 13th, 2021. The first part was my one-on-one -on -one discussion with Professor Anderson, and part, this part two consists of audience q and A. I want to say a special thank you to Albert Bates for help with this recording. Kevin Anderson is Professor of Energy and Climate Change at the University of Manchester in the UK, the University of Uppsala in Sweden, and the University of Bergen in Norway. He is also with the Tyndall Center in the UK. This interview is part of a series of interviews with climate scientists, technologists, authors, advocates, communicators, and others involved in understanding and fighting climate change. It is sponsored by the Climate Chat Club on the social platform Clubhouse. If you are a member of Clubhouse, please join our club. Note that the audio quality in this recording is limited. Future interviews will feature improved audio quality. And now, here is part two of my interview with Kevin Anderson. Stein, thanks. You've been waiting a long, long time. Uh, what's your question for Kevin? Thank you. Thank you very much also for bringing Kevin in here. Like you, I've been following him for many years. Uh, Kevin, I want to remind you of the 2013 COP in Warsaw when you and Alice Box Larkin were presenting. And you were telling the audience that uh, the only way to achieve uh, or avoiding uh, crossing dangerous thresholds for temperature rise would be if the developed nations of the world accepted a period of financial uh, reduction, of growth reduction. Yeah. And, the, and the Norwegian politician Nikolai Astrup rose up and protested there and then and said that growth reduction was totally irresponsible and unnecessary. He's now one of the ministers in our government. And he claims that growth reduction is absolutely not necessary in order to achieve the reduced emissions that, that are required. You mentioned yourself uh, at the end of uh, your last answer here that we have a much smaller carbon budget than we imagine. And I, I'd like you to address that. To what extent should the developed nations accept a period of growth reduction? And then in contrast to what we're seeing now where all the nations are at the tether, they want to return to normal and have an economic blast post COVID. Do you think we have a chance at all? Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's a really important question and one that a lot of people do, do ponder over. And actually, just the last few days has been a, a very interesting article in Nature Communications, and I'm pretty certain it's free access. I cannot remember the name of the person that, that, that authored, there was a number of authors, but it actually looks specifically at this point, looking at degrowth scenarios to try and stay, well, whether degrowth scenarios, as they call them, could stay between 1.5, low 1.5. Um, to a centigrade, so it's a, an article well worth reading. Um, and a lot of people are working on degrowth, so there are whole academic communities lo looking at this. My personal take, and in fact, I just tweeted about this other the other day, is almost now is I think I think the language of degrowth, and, and I could be wrong on this. Other people take have different views, but I almost think it's it's for two reasons. It's an, it's unhelpful. One. It just puts some people off straight away. So really good arguments might come under the under the sort of label of degrowth, and because people don't like the language of degrowth, then they don't listen to the good arguments that might be underneath it. But but second, it's also it's still this idea that actually, the more I think about this, the more I don't like it. It's because it privileges a particular form of looking at the world. In other words, we, we measure everything in pounds, dollars, yen, or whatever the currency might be. So we take the heterogeneous world we live in, when we've got everything from our love for our child, the enjoy of going out fishing for the day, or going to my favorite place without cycling, or rock climbing, from enjoying a, a party with our friends, to all, you know, to, to every single facet of our life. It says it can somehow find a monetary value to that. Um, and then once you've got that monetary value, everything's substitutable. You can substitute a good night out for the cost of a car park. I mean, everything simply gets substitutable because you give it a single currency. Um, and I think that is deeply problematic. And, um, and, so I, and, and then once you've done that, of course, you can apply the rules of economics like discounting and all those other things and trading and all those things that, you, that, that I think are part of the problem here. Um, and so my preference more recently is to be move away from degrowth altogether and say, what are the things we're interested in? And it's improvement in things like quality of life. It's improvement in, our, uh, the, in the robustness of our ecosystem services. It's improvement in terms of um, the security of the lives that we live. So there, there are lots of things, improvement in river quality. There are lots of things that we, want, that we know we want in our world that are good. So why not just measure them, if they're measurable at all? But why not just measure those things 
in their own metric. Why do we then assume that an astrologist, pardon me, an economist, should then come along and convert all of those things into a single index called pounds or dollars or whatever it might be? What, and and then, then play with it from there. I think it's a really unhelpful way of looking at the world. And actually, this whole concept of economic growth is quite new. This, this framing everything around GDP growth isn't, hasn't, doesn't have some really huge, long history. And I think it's got completely out of sync with where it was when it was first introduced and how it's developed. So I think we just move away from that altogether. But the other part of that is to say that if you want to stick with thinking about it to some degree, is that if you look at... A, a rich, rich parts of the world. And if you look at actually around the world more generally, most of the emissions come from a very small group of people. So equity plays out hugely importantly, not just between rich and poor countries, but actually within countries. I mean, the US is a deeply unequal country, as is the UK. When I work in Sweden, it's still got significant levels of inequality, but nothing like the sort of levels of inequality that you see in rich countries like the UK and, and the US. And I think that's interesting because when we talk about degrowth, say, for the UK, that does not mean necessarily that the majority of people in the UK would not see some improvement in their material well-being. Hopefully they would do. They would see those. We still have 10 to 20% of the UK households um, in fuel, what we call fuel poverty. They can't even heat their houses enough in the winter to kill off the bronchals, the spores that give their children bronchial conditions. You know, it's like we've still got people sort of living like it was in the 1900s. And we still have that in one of the richest countries in the world. Um, and so I think for those communities, the significant numbers of people in our society, even under a sort of degrowth scenario, would actually see significant improvements in their welfare, better quality housing, uh, less air pollution, uh, better quality jobs from all the responding to climate change, um, you know, uh, um, better public transport. So all of those things would be play out good for climate and good for them. They're seeing an improvement in prosperity. But for the wealthy of us, and this is the problem of climate change, the wealthy is the wealthy of us who are the big problem, and we don't like to admit that. Our large houses are driving a lot, are flying, are flying a lot, are consumer goods. We may recycle things, we may, be, we may look clean and sparkly, but actually our emissions are hugely high. Our consumption of goods and resources around the world is hugely high, and we've completely normalized it. Amongst that group, degrowth has profound repercussions. You, know, you can't be owning two or three houses. You can't be owning huge mansions. You can't be driving around in three tons of cars in the States or a ton and a half car in the, in the UK with one person next to driving a few kilometers. So you start to unpick the things that those of us who are deeply profligate in our use of emissions uh, and do use of energy and indeed our, our use of resources, for us it's going to be profound change. So degrowth, if you break degrowth down, from this sort of aggregate national level, it plays out very differently within the constituencies within our society. But of course, who are the ones that make the policies? They're the, they're the policy makers, the academics, the entrepreneurs, they're all the ones that have done well in that formal sense. And for that particular group, the ones that are making the climate change agenda and many of the agendas in our society, we all know it's gonna be difficult for us. And so we, we, we dare not question that sort of degrowth. We'll, we'll undermine it every occasion. Question. So, so uh, that's my that's my take. I think I think it's essential that we have to think if we are to respond to climate change, and in fact, more so the broader sustainability agenda, which includes lots of issues to do with resources and land rights and so forth. Then I think the wealthy parts of the world will have to see significant levels of what formerly would be called degrowth, um, if we're going to stay within any with any sort of reasonable environmental uh, planetary boundaries. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you. I said, Stacy, go ahead with the question. I'm sorry. So, Kevin, thanks so much for being here. Um, you uh, perked up my ears with the, um, well, two things. One is likening it to the war effort, because I agree it's about the closest thing that we have as a proxy. And so wondering how we uh, yeah. get more people on board with this, including governments, in terms of uh, the ability to make emergency-style decisions. And then also the... Um, you're not going to make cars anymore. Uh, that's uh, that's a fond one for me um, because that's causing a lot of it, especially here in the U.S. I think it's a full third um, is transport is uh, for um, emissions um, and our, our footprint. So, uh, is this possible? Can we can we start getting people and governments to rally around this and act this way and? Um, could we get them to stop making cars and make bikes instead? Thanks. This is Stacy. Yeah. Um, I mean, other people have much more expertise on this than me. Um, I would turn around to go back to the point I made earlier that we, we have we have a choice between two radical options. There isn't um, uh, you know, whatever the options we are, they are deeply radical. 
to either make the sorts of radical changes that you're saying are necessary, and I'm agreeing with you, to, to, to meet our climate change commitments in terms of the 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade framing, we either make those sorts of changes, which are the, the sort of scale you're talking about, or we end up with the, 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 the climate impacts. And both of those have massive reper- political repercussions. The problem is, of course, there's a time lag between them. And so that's where you have to have that, the courage and leadership of today's policy makers if we're going to deal with mitigation. Because dealing with mitigation, reducing emissions, we have to do that. That policy landscape is now. It's a policy landscape that we can have some organisation over. The policy landscape to deal with massive levels of climate impacting us is, is going to be a completely messy and, and, and very dangerous one. And so the policy makers under those two realms are both going to have to deal with this. But because there's a the time lag between them is how do we get today's ones to recognize the responsibility that is on their shoulders? And it's not just on their shoulders. It's on all of our shoulders to a degree. I'm not saying we're all equally responsible, but we, we can all get engaged in the political debate. Um, and I think particularly in democracies, a lot of us have, have, um, have forgotten the, the wonderful benefits that offers 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 us um, and we don't we're, we're always cri- we're critical of it we're cynical of it but we don't in- often don't engage in it other than the odd election and moaning down the pub um, so i think we have to get much more engaged as civil society um, in our in our politics and if we did do that then maybe there would be much more scope for change so uh, um, but i think we all, the language of climate emergency is interesting because a lot of people are signing up to that companies and leaders and so forth i'm not sure what the position is in the states but certainly biden's talked about it in the, in the language that seems to capture the essence of emergency but then I think, I mean, you could, you could then sort of evoke, you know, Greta's concern here. Well, if it's an emergency, how come we're not responding like it is an emergency? And there is, a, there is something there. Then it, well, as soon as you admit it's an emergency, well, then it's the rest of us, it's the citizens of a society, say, well, where's the response to this emergency? Don't call it an emergency and then carry on with business as usual with a bit of green fluff added to it. You know, you've, got to, you've got to respond to it. And I think, I think just coming back briefly to the U.S., now you, many of you there will know the U.S. Uh, much better than me. And it's interesting, Biden's comments on the sort of some of the other things that he's looking to push are just hugely challenging, and, and all credit to him for doing that, if you like that sort of progressive agenda, which, which I do. Um, but when it comes to climate change, the people are sort of saying, isn't this wonderful? He's at 50 to 52 percent reduction compared with 2005, which is a you know, really high emissions level in the US. So it, it, that already changes you know, where you're going to head with that. Now, this is by 2030. If we follow out Biden, if Biden is successful in reducing emissions in the U.S. by 2030, in accordance with what he's saying so far, that means in 2030, the emissions per capita in the U.S. will still be 30 percent higher than the EU is today. It'll still be 25 percent higher than China is today. It'll still be 29 times or 30 times higher than the typical Kenyan is today. And so it gives you a sense of the scale we're talking about. Even the radical shifts in reducing emissions that Biden is talking about barely touch the surface of what surface of what the US would need to deliver and of course the other rich countries need to cars rapidly as well and so I, I'm really not yet thinking we're, we're fully on board with what the repercussions are of staying within a carbon budget that's roughly 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade and, and if we are going to do that then it, it, it is an absolute emergency um, and, you know, and maybe we won't be it's too late that the house is burning down and maybe we can't, we can't stop it for many people but, but the quicker we the quicker we get on board with that emergency and trying to put the fire out, then the then the, the, the fewer people and the fewer ecosystems are damaged. Um, but how we bring people along on that? I mean, George when George Marshall talks on this, I mean he he will be more useful in that. But my job as an academic, I think my job as an academic is just to, is to do our research carefully, recognise we get things wrong from time to time, and change it accordingly, um, and then to communicate our, our, our findings directly, bluntly, and courteously, and actually. You know, we all have our different roles to play. And I think that's the role of academics. But I think partly because we've all, there's so many people locked into delusion about we're not prepared to accept the scale of the challenge we're in. So we're all, I often say, we, I'm, I'm less worried about the exons of this world. I'm worried about the people who say, yeah, I believe the climate science, but we will not believe mitigation. We're mitigation deniers. Most of us who work on climate change are mitigation deniers. We're not prepared to accept the repercussions of what our own science that we accept tells us. Um, and so that still that, that means we're still some way off there. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. Right, right. And just speaking here from San Francisco, where we two years ago, our board of supervisors declared a climate emergency and they want to do everything they can to stay within 1.5 degrees um, Celsius. And yet we've done nothing. Yeah. We've, uh, you know, new housing can't have gas fixtures. That's it. That's the only thing we've done in two years, yet it's an emergency. So yes, please, I would. I wish I could shout you from every rooftop here. Thanks, we need Lisa. more of this, thanks. Hey, Ilana, what's your question for Kevin? Uh, 
Yeah, thank you. This is so interesting. My um, field is sustainable development, so you're speaking to um, everything that I do, and, I, I, and you've just spelled out the impossible task that I've um, chosen for myself, which is to change the behaviour starting at the luxury goods market and working down, because that's where my previous expertise was. Um, but I genuinely believe that if we make that desirable if we play on that noblesse oblige i think that's you know if we market it to be aspirational and to be the right thing to do i think that's probably one of the best hopes we have from a marketing perspective to change the behavior but i'm really interested in um your thought process and and i don't expect you to to call out names but on the big um names within the space around um, sustainable solutions, so the technological solutions. I don't believe that technology will save us on its own, but there are some big voices in that space. And um, so I'm interested if you think any of the propositions out there, obviously Elon Musk has come out today talking about Bitcoin or yesterday, whenever it was. Yeah. Um, but is there anyone out there that is doing as much as they possibly could. I'm trying to be polite about the question. <laughs> or uh, <laughs> you are reading between the lines. But but is there a lot of showmanship and not a lot of action? Uh, that's my feeling on it. But I'm, I don't do the numbers as well as you do. So my question is really, is there any of those technological solutions that are doing it? Or am I right in my belief that it's our behaviour that just needs to change? <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't think you will be responsive to the... Again, if, you, if we think the 1.5 degree C framing is the appropriate one, and that's a judgment we can make one way or another, but it's certainly one we have, it's one we've signed up to. I don't think you can deal, You can respond to that um, either with just with behaviour or just with technology. Both of them will fail. Um, I, and actually, I, I also like... The, my social science colleagues have an awful expression, which I think is really... It captures a really important understanding, but I think the expression is terrible, and it's technical... A, a, a technical regime. So they refer to these. You know, the technologies don't exist. They only exist um, within a, within a sort of realm, if you like, like within within society. So you can't see the technology as an isolated thing. And I think that's really important. So technology change is not something that is just imposed upon society. Technologies and societies change together, and and that's really important to recognise. So you can't just solve. You know, if you solve, if you try to solve a problem with technology, you're so, you're also changing behaviour. The idea that you accept the technologies, how will those technologies be used? So when people talk, we just substitute for electric vehicles. Those electric vehicles will change our behavior in society. So there'll be this blend between what they're invented for and how they end up being used. Mobile phones, how often now do we, do we just focus on a mobile phone? It just, it's just for phone calls. We have no video conference on, we have no sort of a teleconference on ours now. They also use sort of a map, photographs, yeah so, so, yeah, so all of this. So what happens is the technologies don't, don't just do what the inventors think. They are, they are morphed by society. And so there is no such thing in the sense of, of just a technological solution. But nevertheless, the sort of essence of your question is, can we just effectively get some, can we substitute some of the technologies we have today for some alternative technology that will allow us the same levels of, of service um, with, with much better emissions? And can we also add to those other technologies that might be moved to CO2 from the atmosphere or whatever that might be that will, that will um, resolve this issue without fundamental behavioral change? And I think it's absolutely Categorically, the answer to that is no. The maths do not play out, and it's because of the time frame issue. You know, if it was 100 years, yes, we'll, we'll fix the technology issue, we'll fix it with substitution. But actually, in the time frames that we have, you simply cannot deliver things fast enough. And I think most people, even many people working on climate change, simply misunderstand the numbers. So things like electrification is a good example. You know, I'm all in favour of a lot of these technologies. I'm all in favour of a lot more electrification. But of the energy we consume in rich industrialised countries, typically considerably less than 20% of it, what we call final energy consumption, is electricity. The other 80% or more is not electricity. And yet when people talk about change, they all talk about wind turbines or solar panels or you know, dams, whatever it might be, about electricity. And actually the time it would take to build the renewable um, alternatives, put the grid in place, to put all the infrastructure for trams in place and charging systems and all those other things, by that time, you, 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 because we've continue to emit, you blow your budget. And so behavioural, profound behavioural change, particularly amongst the high emitters, I re-emphasise that, particularly amongst the high emitters, is an absolute prerequisite, along with changes in technology. Those two have to go together. And, and my concern is that we have many of the technologies that we need are already there. 
yeah, it can be, for instance, you know, bicycles, good quality pavements to so get to work, good quality public transport so that we can use for slightly longer journeys, we can use other forms of technology like that. And then maybe in the rural environments, maybe we use some electrical vehicles that could be rented um, and, and so forth, rather than necessarily owned. So we have the technologies, we have the policy frameworks, we have the imaginations to put these things together that could just about hold us below two degrees centigrade. We're, not, we're simply not prepared to do it, primarily in my view, because we recognize the point at the beginning, things like you know, this idea of luxury, and of course we've normalized luxury. People like me have normalized luxury, so I don't think my life is luxurious, but of course it is to most people in the world, even to most people in my own country. Um, and because people like me are the ones that have fraught the policy, you know, we, you know, we're in this real sort of dilemma that we're not prepared to be honest, because to be honest requires us to sort of psychologically step outside of, a, of, of, of an area, we're, uh, of an arena that we're comfortable in. So all of these things are playing out. Behavior, um, practices, as some of my social science colleagues would call them norms and, and routines, and the technologies themselves, and the fact is that the majority of the change, that, that sort of profound behavioral shift, is going to have to occur from a relatively small, small cohort of the most well-paid, influential people in our society. Um, put that all together, it looks almost impossible. But I think it is possible, just about the two degrees centigrade. But relying on the technologies is actually stopping us facing the scale of the challenge that's actually in front of us. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Hey Jim, you're up. What's your question for Kevin? Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, um, I, I appreciate your, your uh, urgency because it's absolutely necessary. And your appreciation that radical change is required, particularly in, the, in our consumption. And um, uh, you did touch on economists trying to fit everything into a single currency, you know, where obviously value doesn't fit into, into monetary systems that we, we know of. And, and um, uh, I, I wonder if you've run across this idea, which is in the book that it's instead of my picture, Ministry for the Future, it's for a, a central bank carbon currency. And the carbon currency is a different kind of money and is a, a mitigation, a carbon mitigation. And that's both of them, which would pay for the degrowth of economies. Maybe out there. Oh, it, uh, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Maybe so try, ask your question and just quickly yeah. maybe get through it. Yeah. Um, so the, have you run across this idea or considered the idea of a, of a parallel currency that supports carbon mitigation? Um, if I understand, I'd say there was quite a lot of that breaking up, uh, out there, breaking up in the um, you're speaking. If I understand what you're saying, then yes, it is something I've thought about. And I, I, if I'm going off in a the, the tangent here, yeah, do tell me. Um, a long time ago, 2005, a colleague um, um, of mine, Richard Stark, and I published something in the UK, a fairly sort of detailed report on something called terrible, another terrible acronym, acronym, um, acronym the DTQs, Domestic Tradable Quotas, Personal Carbon Allowance. And in that, we were actually saying that what you could have... Um, was you would have a, an allowance of carbon that might be issued every three months or a year, whatever it might be, um, and you had to live within that allowance. And any allowance you didn't use, you could you could trade, and that allowance would come down. Your personal allowance would come down every single month um, or every single year, um, to, so that you you you, you stayed in the appropriate carbon budget. And we looked at that for household use of energy and for fuels and so forth. We looked at the, the IT stuff behind it, which actually was pretty straightforward. Um, and it was so that in that sense we developed this this. Uh, uh, additional currency that goes ahead with, with money. So if you went to buy some petrol, for instance, you'd buy the petrol, you pay out with your credit card, and it would automatically swipe off some of your carbon allowance. And if you hadn't got enough carbon allowance, you knew, you'd end up having to buy some off the market, which cost you quite a lot more money, which was significantly increased the price. And because the, the allowance came down every year, this actually was very equitable. So it was a fair approach, unlike the standard carbon tax. The fee and dividend that, that uh, Hanson and others have been talking about in the US for a long time, I think that again effectively puts a, develops a, a carbon currency um, I think there was some attraction to these sort of options. I, as someone who did not warm to a fee and dividend one at first, I actually warmed it much more. The problem is I think it needs to be really, really high very rapidly. Um, um, so I, I think that that sort of currency running alongside our um, financial world could work really well. But I would, but it, it, but it, but it, must, it mustn't do. We all have this idea we start things off gentle and then we, we ramp them up. Well, that's fine if you started in 1990 with the first IPCC report. It's fine if you started in 2000 or 2009 with the Copenhagen Accord. 
But it's 2021, we've squandered the budget, so we have to start off at the blunt end of the wedge. There's no starting off at the thin end of the wedge anymore. We've, we've forgotten that opportunity. So yeah, if we're going to put a currency in there, let's put one in. Let's make sure it's fair, and the equity part is absolutely key. And I think most economists miss the equity component of, of this. But I think the fee and dividend is an approach, and indeed some, some ways the carbon allowance approach, personal carbon allowance approach is one that can help us deal with that. Um, but the caps are really important. And in the EU, they have got the emissions trading scheme, which I've been really critical of. And I most of the time I'm critical of the trading schemes because the people, what happens there is usually the cap is up very, very weak, like the emissions trading scheme. And what happens is a few wealthy finance types mess around with futures and trading and make an absolute fortune and live really high carbon lifestyles. And that's the bugger all happens in terms of reducing emissions. <laughs> and the emissions trading scheme in the EU has been a bit, what has been like that. Now it could be run different. So there are ways that the currency is in. Yeah, but I agree with you, by the way, on that. And look, I work with Johansson on, on fee and dividend promoting that. So uh, we can have a whole separate discussion on that one as well. But let, we have a lot of people here, so let's keep going. And David, hey, what's your question for Kevin? Hey, Kevin, uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Climate Chat. It's, this is really great. Um, and I was just going to start with, like, almost a joke. So a Cro-Magnon and a Hope, almost Sapien walk into a bar. And so the reason why, I, and I have to turn it into a real joke, but I, I, the way I look at, at all this is this is this is a need for us to evolve, right? That that's kind of our problem. That the, what you're describing regarding our, you know, the, the is, the is the culture of our carbon and our consumption uh, culture. So my, my question has to do, and I'm kind of in, in the behavioral change using games to 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 kind of catalyze more behavioral change to address the problem, but. Specifically, what, it's kind of like what we've seen, how the science has been evolving as we've been learning in your modeling. I'm just curious real specifically on, as you, uh, kind of picking up on, the, on your response to the last question in, in using the carbon costing, because it's going to have to really get significant. Were there any unforeseen or unintended outcomes that you saw in some of the modeling that were, were you know, kind of shocking or insightful or interesting? I hope that question's kind of clear enough to, 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 for you to kind of speak to, because just as we're seeing with the science and the ash, you know, falling on the ice and it reduces the reflectivity, you know, it's kind of scary as these new uh, insights are emerged. I'm just wondering in your modeling if you've seen some other um, socio-science issues. Thank you so much. Um. Firstly, I, I think there are lots of other people who know, again, much more about this than me from sort of the, sort of the social repercussions of the rapid changes that we're, that we're talking about here, or indeed if you were to apply, it, to apply for some sort of carbon currency, or indeed a simple, simple, simple carbon tax, and how that would play out. Um, I think that the way, my, my understanding so far from what I've read, and it's not an idea directly, but reading other people's work, often sort of established economists doing a lot of this, is that they, I think they, they completely neglect or or to give lip service to issues of equity. So I think what we have to be really careful about is when we put things in place, that society is not a homogenous um, mass. Again, society is deeply heterogeneous. So if you, if you use a carbon tax, you've got to be really careful that people who are already struggling to pay the fuel to get to work, um, or are already struggling to actually be able to heat their homes or whatever it might be, that if you apply some other additional cost, you, you, you push people at those margins, you push them under with all the repercussions that come out of that. Um, and yet that, that approach might work quite well at the median person. But who is the median person? Who is the mean person? Um, and, and so I think often our policies need to be um, more nuanced and tailored to particular groups in our society. Um, now, that's, that's almost like anathema to some economists because they sort of see that almost like that you require sort of a generic thing that's the most efficient. But actually, this is not just about efficiency because the system inefficiency might be really poor. You might be efficient with delivering the one thing, but if then you've got lots of people who are unemployed or, or can't heat their homes or losing their homes because of the additional financial burden of addressing some, some additional carbon tax, for instance, then the repercussions of that for society will be dire. And so I think you really have to tailor, whatever the approaches may be, you have to tailor them to, to recognize that society has different groups within it, even with standards and regulations. If you put a, a standard in that does something to do with cars, which I'm, which I'm deeply in favour of standards and regulations rather than, than monetary instruments, most of the time, not all the time, um, but you put those in place and that might do things that like, might change the second-hand car market. The prices of that might rocket for the roof, which means that poor people who are relying on second-hand or third-hand cars can't afford them anymore. Now, I'd like to see us all move away from cars, but in the interim, in the short period, maybe things like that might be important. Um, and so I just think that we have to be careful about policies we put in place to make sure that they do understand 
the range of uh, groups within our society. Now, if you're in somewhere like Sweden, where it's much more even, an equal society, I think it is true that you probably put policies in place that don't have this, don't have such variation across different socioeconomic groups. But you look at the US, I mean, the US it demonstrates everything from sort of deep levels of poverty to absolutely, in my view, um, I don't know if the US psychology might be different on this, absolutely obscene levels of wealth. We see that in the UK. You don't see those sorts of quite such differentials in some of the Scandinavian countries. Um, and so I think that your policies have to be tailored and aligned to the cultural diversity of your own particular country. If that in any way is helpful, I don't know. It's awesome. Well, yeah, so you, so do, you think, you think there's a problem when like five people in the United States have more wealth than the bottom 50%? I don't know. It's, it's, I, I mean, I can't, not my climate change analysis, um, I think I think I could probably say it's a problem for my climate change analysis as well, actually. Having, having had the displeasure of listening to Bill Gates uh, on, right. and read out his book in the UK, um, I think it misunderstood. I think, I mean, I think, I don't directly blame him for this, but I, I blame a lot of the sycophantic journalists who didn't question him. But I mean, it, right. it, you know, this whole idea that, and that was a good example of with Gates when he was sort of saying, well, I'm buying lots of biofuels. That's biofuels that could be used to operate, to, to run the, the generators to run operating theatres um, or, or right. other small yeah. companies. And when you've got limited amount of renewable resources, to put them all into allowing a person to fly around in a private jet means that other ones can't use it. And so there's a triage approach but in, in that, which I think is really important to recognize. In a, in a time-limited response to a big challenge, you have to triage. You have to say, well, where can we best use the scarce resources we have available? In this case, you know, low-carbon energy. So I think the, wealth in, the, the huge wealth inequalities are absolutely fundamental in this. You know, and, and I think I'll go slightly further and say, when you look at the Davos set put in together every year and trying to sort of dictate how the world should operate, you know, and they're flying in some of them in private jets, and by and large, all of them will be incredibly high emitters. That, 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 that is deeply problematic. You're asking the high emitters to deal with climate change. It's the foxes and the chicken coop. Right, okay. <laughs> like a whole other room on that, I think. Uh, thanks so much, uh, David. And hey, Iman? Did I say your name right? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Kevin, amazing directness, and I really appreciate that. My question is, and you've talked, and you've, you've just touched on it, on the, the disproportionate impact of high-income groups, both in, in Western economies, but more specifically in, in particular economies. Could you just talk a little bit, if we were serious and less delusional about achieving things like par of achieving Paris, what does that lifestyle look like for those higher-income deciles? in terms of the kind of practical things that they, they expect, like the car usage, uh, the, the flights, and, yeah. and, and other consumption. Thanks. I mean, in the long run, and in the, in the several decades, you know, 2050, 2100, whatever it might be, yeah, perhaps we can find ways to reconcile those sorts of lifestyles with, with not just with climate change, I think we can resolve. Climate change is the easy part of sustainability. Yeah, the, other, the other issues around sustainability, you know, if we can reconcile it with those, then fine. You know, I don't like that politically, but you know, that's, my analysis doesn't tell me doesn't tell me whether I should like it or not. It just tells can you fit it in. From a climate point of view, it's absolutely clear these groups are going to have to go through a profound change. You know, and that, that, well, let's just touch on what that might mean. I'm only, I'm only going to flavour of this. I'm not saying this is a this isn't a well thought out policy suite, but things like you know, multiple houses, no multiple houses, because that requires lots more more material, lots more cement, and it's also the point. It's not just that they're all, they're already there. That means you've got to build other ones for other people in, in a growing population which means more resources there, rather than actually converting the houses you already have, second homes or huge mansions, convert them into flats, uh, rental cars, um, much more public transport, um, frequent, and massively, ra rapidly ramping up frequent flyer leverage, so we see dramatic reductions in the amount of flying that we do, in, in the amount of consumption goods that we actually have. So across the board, you're talking about profound changes for those of us who have normalized our high carbon lifestyles. We're not talking here just about the Gates and the Musks either. We're talking about you know, a significant chunk of our society, maybe like a, a third or a fifth of our society, who have really normalized pretty high levels of consumption, sometimes very high levels of consumption. Um, and you know, that group is going to have to see some significant shifts in how, how they, how we uh, live our lives. And I don't think there's any easy way around that. And people say it's a socialist agenda. This has nothing to do with socialism. This is to do with maths. If you want to stay in the budget, you can't squeeze the emissions out of people that barely emit. You've got to squeeze the emissions out of the people and there's plenty of them, uh, those of us who are responsible for the lion's share of emissions. So just very roughly, and probably most of you are aware of this, but at a global level with high inequality, around half of all global emissions come from the activities of about, of about 10% of the world's population, of which about um, two thirds of those are in the wealthier parts of the world. So roughly one in three in the wealthy parts of the world are actually in that top 10% group, very approximately. Um, the top 1% of emitters globally 
have, a, have emissions that are twice as high as the bottom 50% of the global population. Just think about that, those differences. These are absolutely huge differences. You cannot overcome this with technology overnight. Yeah, technology might be able to resolve some of these issues in the in the one decade, two decade, three decade period. Probably not from a sustainability point of view, but from a carbon point of view. But actually, you're not going to solve it fast enough to stay within the carbon budget. So there is no choice but for that group to reduce its emissions. Climate change, and this is going to be really unpopular, climate change is essentially a rationing issue. We have a certain amount of carbon that we can dump in the atmosphere. Now, however you may think about that, once you've got a limited amount of something you can do, you've then got to think, well, how do you fairly hand that out? That is rationing. Change the word. Give it another name, whatever you want to do. You know, ask the psychologists what name's best for people to accept. But we are innately having to live within a ration. And of course, we're all used to rations. It's called our salary. So for most of us, we're living in rations anyway, of one sort or another. It's just another ration that if we're serious about climate change, that's what we have to accept. But we're not prepared to um, accept those rations because as soon as you've got something out, you've got to ration. And then the world can say, well, I'd like it all, please. The rest of society says, oh, I don't think that's quite fair. I mean, I'd like something for my children and my, my local hospital and, and for my local businesses. I don't see why you should have it all. So the, the income disparities, which means the emission disparities, is absolutely key to responding to climate change. And there's a wealth of um, mathematical scientific evidence to back that up now. And there are papers galore that have been looking at this. Um, but of course, it's really unpopular um, for policymakers to start to say, well, how do we actually embed this within our policy agenda? Great. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, John, hey, uh, wait, I think you're right. Hey. John, you're up. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you to the Climate Check folks and Kevin. This is a fascinating discussion. I'm, I'm curious to ask you about a pretty provocative article, April 22nd, on the conversation by James Dyke, Robert Watson, oh, yeah. and Ken uh, Climate scientist, colon, concept of net zero is a dangerous trap. I can restate it, but if, are you familiar with the article, Kevin? I am, and I know James, and I know uh, Bob Watson very well. <laughs> well, I would rather have you state it with your expertise than this and mangle it in front of you. Could you talk about this article and the premise and, and what you think about it, please? Um, well, I, I, I did comment on Twitter about it. I think it was a really important article, and it was it was courageous of them to come out and, and say it, and it's, and it's caused it's caused quite a stir amongst well amongst the people that read it, um, and, that, and that's amongst a lot of academics. Um, but, so, so, I mean, and a lot of academics found it very, very uncomfortable because it was, it was basically saying that, that, we've, that we have been, we, either we've been party to the delusion or we, we've swallowed the delusion of net zero and that, that that sort of language around net zero has allowed us to, uh, right back to discussions earlier, basically it's allowed us to, um, to, to, to provide these political palatable framings of, of the climate agenda and make it look like we can deliver Paris via the normal sort of incremental, slightly technocratic sort of routes, rather than the sort of profound changes that I'm talking about. And net zero has, has fed into that, um, that whole sort of language of net zero. Which for those aren't familiar, net zero is this idea that at some point in the future you've got to balance your emissions with, um, with, with the sinks that we have, the ways that we find absorbed emissions. So at some, at some point in the future, but it, it, what it's done is delayed the need for rapid change, it's moved it much, much further away but I mean the, the, but increasingly as the article points out I mean there's, there's huge concerns around that any, whether this net zero whether these negative emission technologies or nature based solutions can in any way be delivered at the scale that is assumed in these models um, and, and what Dyke and others are saying is that we've, we've, we've known this for a long time this is nothing new we've been party to this those of us you know, the expert community um, has been party to this delusion um, for well I, I would argue for two decades but certainly for a decade or so um, and, and, and I think probably the last five to ten years we've been pretty knowledgeable that we've been doing this. So it's not as if we can claim willful ignorance. It's, it's been deliberate ignorance over the last short period. So Kevin, that's what it's Kevin, the, the pushback that I've read in the three or four weeks this has been out says that, well, whatever, net zero is out there in the vernacular. I mean, hell, there's conferences called net zero. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's everywhere. And they say it's, just, it's, it's valuable for us to have a debate whether or not this has been the, I think the bigger impact is moving the goalpost and refusing to face up to the facts that carbon emissions have to stop. That's just the, yes. that's just the uncomfortable fact. And yeah, no amount of scenario building can change that. No, I, I, I was, uh, one of my comments about this, and it was uh, in relation to something, is, um, Simon Evans wrote a defense of net zero in Carbon Brief, and it's definitely worth reading, and Simon invites some good stuff. I disagree with a lot of his work. I think Carbon Brief is a, on mitigation is quite a sort of a 
um, almost like a communication arm of the Committee on Climate Change in the UK, and I tend to think it's, it's quite conservative in its approach. But nevertheless, it's well worth reading Simon's response to, to Dyke's article. Um, and to me, one of the problems there is that we're, we're again, it's like with economics, we're, we're shoving everything together. So you can, you can you know, cut back on the amount of sheep you've got, and that means you can slightly expand your airport. You can build some more trees somewhere, plant some more trees somewhere, and that means you can develop a, a bigger auto bridge. And it's this substitution, I think, is really problem, problematic in net zero. So I would much prefer, prefer to see it. I, mean, I don't think they were locked in yet. It's quite a new phenomenon, and it's, and it's very rapidly got a lot of people criticising it. So I, I, think we, I think it could be changed. I would rather see separate targets or separate ob- obligations. So for energy, it would be real zero. So there'd be no emissions of CO2 for energy. But for agriculture, you'd have a rate of reduction for emissions from methane and N2O emissions. So it would be, a, and there would be no substitution. And there shouldn't be a substitution because the gases aren't directly comparable. From a science point of view, you can't easily compare X tons of methane with Y tons of CO2. I know we have this thing called global warming potential, but it's incredibly unhelpful. They're not, they're not comparable. They have different chemical repercussions. They have hugely level, different, different levels of uncertainty about the emissions from, say, you know, trees planted now, what the emissions are going to be in 2030, 2040, compared to the emissions that come out of the back end of a car today, which are really well known and precise. So I think the, the substitution is a real problem. So let's, let's break that down and let's have separate targets for, say, different greenhouse gases from different major sources. So agriculture could be one, and land use, and energy would be a separate one with zero CO2 emissions. And I think there's still scope for doing that. And I was surprised when I put the tweet out about it, how many people, including Simon and some of the other, Simon Evans and other people, actually were saying that actually there's some merit in it as well. So I, I don't think Net Zero yet is locked in. I think it's, it's quickly being put in, it's a fudge, it's dangerous, and lots of people recognise that. And I think it's, it, but maybe it's time, it's, it, maybe it's just opening up a debate that gives a much more fruitful outcome than the Net Zero has been. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, speaking of Simon, Simon, <laughs> you're up. <laughs> yeah, Dad, is it possible I might go next? Uh, this is Rupert Reed. I've, I've got a, it's actually my birthday, and I've got an evening engagement. I've got to go. Oh, to. I, it's a birthday. Yeah, we have a special I, exception I, for birthdays. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I will. I will before. Thanks so much, yeah, Rupert. Go ahead. Um, thanks, um, Kevin. Hi, good to good to see you again. Um, can I inject a, a, a note of, uh, of even kind of harsher reality into the conversation? Well, what you're saying, Kevin, all of it makes super sense, as always. But isn't the real bottom line of an awful lot of what you're saying that the chances of us succeeding in doing what we, of course, ought to be doing and still must aim for, the kind of stuff you're talking about, are so minuscule that really it's time for a big reset which involves us getting much more serious about the needful presence of adaptation. In other words, basically the chances of us achieving the kind of mitigation goals you're talking about are are minuscule. We have to get serious about adaptation. If we do adaptation in the traditional shallow incremental defensive way, it'll be absolutely catastrophic. So we have to try to, to, to massively shift the focus of climate activism and climate policy towards transformative adaptation. We also have to increasingly acknowledge that 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 may well not succeed. So we also need to start devoting some resources to deep adaptation, in other words, to preparing for the potential of actual full-on societal collapse. Is that not the the true implication of the picture you've been painting, Kevin? And doesn't this require a, a seismic and, for many people, deeply unwelcome and challenging shift in our priorities and our discourse? I think it complements our priorities. I don't think it substitutes them. I, I absolutely agree with you on the adaptation side. We're, adaptation has always been the Cinderella issue. And I've just recently yeah. been involved in a, a revolved, deeply involved in the climate assembly with the Scottish government. And uh, and despite the fact there was some work, quite a lot of talk about adaptation in there or the evidence, that actually when the members were looking at this, there was almost nothing that came out in terms of adaptation. Um, so yeah, I, firstly, let's be clear. In terms of success, I, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think we're going to succeed in, in staying below you know, 2 degrees centigrade. I, mean, I think there's probably a you know, 95% chance we're going to fly through 2 degrees centigrade up towards 3 and probably more. But, but, but that failure is partly going to be due to our choice. So we have a choice whether to succeed. I just think when you put all that together at the moment, we don't look like we're going to choose to do that. But that's why we work on this, because we hope we can. And we're going to try and push that agenda as hard as we possibly can. Nevertheless, at the same time, because I think what you recognise is yours and there that we need to, we're going to have to adapt. And I think it's important there is that who's the we in that? 
Because what is adaption? Is it, is it building a sort of shelter underneath your posh mansion in Florida? Or is that adaptation thinking about the communities living around the sure. coast of Bangladesh? You've got to yeah. do transformative adaptation and not just traditional shallow incremental. We have, but I mean, if, again, I think if you're very careful about the we, the we've got to do it. What does that mean? Is it, I mean, I don't know how you, how you transform the agricultural communities of the coast of Bangladesh or the communities that were hit in Haiyan or in the Philippines or the ones in Mozambique. Or, you know, and, and I think you're right. And I think that debate needs to be had, but I think we have to be careful about the we in this and quite what it means to adapt to these sorts of changes. And I also think we have to be careful with maladaption because if, because we're all pretending we're going to hit 1.5 to 2 and let's hope we can put policy in place that, that, that can, that's why we have events like this, I suppose. Um, let's hope we can do that. But let's not just adapt for two, because that could mean if you adapt for two and we fail, then you might be maladapted for four degrees centigrade. Because what's necessary for two in terms of you know, how deep do you build your sewage lines or your water, whatever it might be, your fresh water lines, do, do you build it for sea level rise of two degrees centigrade or four degrees centigrade? And so I think we have to make sure the adaptation we put in is actually robust and resilient to very high temperature changes as well. And that's not a simple thing. We don't need to thought that through. And I, I, I take your point on the uh, deep adaptation. A lot of people talk about this, the sort of... Um, Embedded stuff in Dark Mountain and other people like that. Um, as long as it doesn't come with a doomism element to it, because we, we are not certain from the science. The one good thing about the science, to some extent, is the uncertainty, and that it allows us to say, actually, you know, I mean, this isn't good enough, but there's some hope resides in the fact that, yes, there, there is a chance if we put out every single stop of mitigation and we're lucky on the climate sensitivity of the science bar, then we might be able to hold below 2 degrees centigrade. Um, so I, I don't want to lose that opportunity to say we, we, there's nothing that should take us away from, from the absolutely key task of cutting emissions, like there's no tomorrow. But at the same time, I think we have to complement that with some real thinking about adaptation. Um, and adaptation has to think about mitigation. You can't just adapt for something and actually make the emissions worse. And so I always thought it would be, be nice to have a word. We, we, we jokingly talked about that in the Tyndall Center years ago, called, you know, mitaption, where you have mitigation and adaptation brought together because they're really two sides of the same coin. Um, but we have completely ignored adaptation at any serious level. But the wee bit, I think we have to really, we're going to have to learn lessons from lots of other parts of the world of what that actually means. So I'm taking your, your point. I just think it, we have to be careful not to, not to, and I'm sure you will be doing this, but make it colonial, if you like. Absolutely. Thanks, Kevin. Agreed. By the way, I'm going to throw in a few comments there myself, uh, because of the subject that we cover a lot on Climate Chat. And that is, uh, while we talked earlier about how carbon capture shouldn't be used to prevent, uh, to slow down mitigation, I totally agree with that. There, and, and Kevin certainly is wondering whether it can scale. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I, I don't see any reason why it can't scale. It exists today, and when something exists, it's possible. And uh, the only question is there are no incentives to do it. There, there's, there's no incentives to do it. But if we wanted to do even uh, 40 or uh, 40 gigatons a year, of, of capture it, it could be done as long and i'm worried about by the way being able to do it before things start hitting the fan right you know <laughs> after a while if we don't have an organized global community it's kind of hard to run massive uh, carbon uh, removal projects but i think we can start it now and it, it will work uh, the technology is there it's clearly there but there's no incentives to deploy so anyway that we'll, we'll spend a, a, a future rooms on that subject but i, I don't i think there, the, the choice is not just uh, do we um, just to cut our emissions by normal means uh, that we do have options and yes uh, we shouldn't use those options to slow down yeah. all the other things yeah, just to say I would say not nor the, t the changes I'm talking about are not normal means normal means are what keep us at the status quo the normal means I'm going to get emission reductions emissions down I mean the, the mitigation I'm talking about are fundamental shifts I mean I wouldn't call the Marshall style plan or anything like that a, a normal situation these are completely right. abnormal so we're talking so the mitigation is not normal it's huge and yes let's try the carbon capture things but the, the point about on most of these issues which we haven't really focused on today very much is time frame and I think the mm -hmm. time frame issues are absolutely key and that's my concern that's my major concern about the carbon removal techniques is most of them require reasonable quantities of energy and in the short term we're really short of low carbon energy we haven't got it in place I mean, not sure we, we're not short of it in the atmosphere but we're short of it in terms of we haven't built the technology and everything else there yet to even decarbonize the things that we're doing let alone having significant surface energy to help us with carbon removal which as I said before I'm all in favor of Keep in mind that a lot of the a lot of carbon removal uh, techniques use, utilize earth energy. For example, uh, Klaus Lackner is the father of carbon removal. 
um, when I spoke of 10 years about this, uh, 10 years ago about this, he said if he ran his system on coal, it would just reduce its efficiency by 20%. <laughs> so, and yeah, that, so a lot of these yeah. systems use uh, heat from the earth or, 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 or moisture from the earth and these kinds of things to run themselves. And they're not like just burning natural gas or something to run. Some of them do, but, but not all of them. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's a whole other, we're going to spend many, many months uh, oh, on that subject. Hey, if anyone is interested in the thread and the, uh, that John had brought up, I'd be happy to send you that link. Um, that was actually a really good talk of my uh, Twitter profile. So, Great. Thank uh, you. Have a, a I think we're going back to Simon now, is that right? And, and Rupert, yeah. happy birthday. Happy birthday. We can all sing it too. Hi, my name is Simon. I'm a zero COVID activist. So I'm not a zero COVID activist from Switzerland. So I, scientific activist, I try to reduce COVID cases to zero. So strategy like using Taiwan or New Zealand. Um, and uh, we face, our community, we face a lot of the same issues as climate activists, but it's just, I call uh, zero COVID activism is, a, is basically climate activism, but on speed, because everything has to be done in weeks or days. Um, so my question is this, so thank you very much for this. For me, there's a huge intersection, because we have, um, you know, politicians that don't listen to the science, then there's these cost-benefit analysis which are completely bonkers. But have you, Kevin, I guess because you're all in contact with politicians or NGOs. Have you noticed a shift in discourse? Because now you've already alluded to it, that now COVID has shown we can do, I mean, what we are doing right now is a martial plan. We are now in a lot of European countries, we have basically universal basic income for some people. We have completely disrupted economies. We can do it. I mean, we've proven it. Uh, and, and so has this, Discord, has this already impacted the discourse in, in the climate change community, or is oh. it only starting? No, no, absolutely, it's not. I don't think it's only um, changed discourse in the climate change community. I think it's. I think it's. So the political policy. I think it's, you it's, have the yeah. Policy. I think across the board, it's, it, I mean, it, it can't help but do that because you now have empirical evidence. When someone turns out and like, that's not possible, they said, well, we did it last week. So it's clearly possible, we've, we've done it. Now, whether, it's, whether you can replicate it, whether you can continue it, is, a, is, a, is an, a, an important question. But we can't turn around and say that's not possible because we have delivered on huge change. So it has, it, from my experience, and the, on the policy realm, it's been interesting with the engagement of the Scottish government recently, but you know, people are recognising, yes, we can do things very you know, differently, and we can do them rapidly in a different way. The problem has been, of course, is that, um, as is always the case at the moment, is we're still obsessed by this, by this sort of uh, mythical beast called the economy. Um, which, of course, I mean, I quite like the Greek root of the economy, which is basically stewards of the household, which is basically looking after your planet, basically. So the original roots of the economy, if we focus on that, I wouldn't mind. But what we mean by the economy is this sort of narrow version of, you know, the financialization of society. That's what it's talking about. Now, that, that version of it, if we're, going to, if we're going to try and go back to maximizing what that looks like, that's going to mean that we're going to play against most of the things that require for climate change. If we're serious about sort of the economy, the, you know, the, the fabric, the wherewithal, the sustainability of our society, which is where the the Greek root of economics comes from, then, then I think that, I think COVID, uh, you know, again, recognizing the deep tragedies that were there, but lots of the lessons in COVID are really helpful in helping us think about, well, what are the things that we need to put in place? But I always think we mustn't overplay the lessons because the lessons are important, but they were, as you said, they were, sh they were put in quickly and they've been quite short lived. And we've got to say, how do we play these out over a longer period of time? And they haven't really also had to really deal with the equity issue. So there's quite a lot of crossover between the, the disparity in climate change and, equi and, and, and poverty in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, COVID. I mean, we do, I mean, if nothing else, we've seen that in terms of vaccination. Who are, the, who are the parts of the world that have been vaccinated? The rich parts of the world have been vaccinated or are rapidly getting vaccinated. So we, you know, inequality plays out in COVID in a way that it's playing out in climate change, in ways that it plays out in energy consumption. And I think the COVID one hasn't responded to that in a way that's helpful for us. But in lots of other areas, that has demonstrated we can deliver rapid change. So yes, I think it is, yes, from my um, experience, it is changing the debate at every single level, civil society level, uh, academic level, and indeed at the policymaker level. Thanks. And I think it's probably in the, probably in the US, I, I, I'm guessing in the US that Biden is able to, I don't know if this is true, but I'm sure, I would think that Biden is able to say some of the things that he's saying because there is, to some degree, an appetite for change that, even in the U.S., that has been triggered sure. by by COVID.
triggered by COVID and also by by people recognizing climate change impacts, which they ignored before. You know, they were they're ha- happening more rapidly now, and, it's, and people are saying that was caused by climate. So that's you know part of what it's going on. I think. Um, let's see. We are on Alexander. Alexander, what's your question for Kevin? Kevin. Um, we will have COP in uh, COP26 in Glasgow in November. Yeah. Do you see a way of uh, operationalizing your insights and making them sort of like a, a common understanding for the world? Um, the COP is a moment, you know, it's, it's called the conference of the parties, but we should actually get to a cooperation of the parties. Um, yeah. How, how do we how do we get there? Because it's a moment that that this knowledge that the small group has can become wider. Yeah, I have to say I think if we work, if we're going to do that, I, I think the COP, I think the COP process is their good bad points and bad points. I think COP twenty six is going to be really problematic. I think it's going to be dominated by net zero, and it will be. Uh, and I, I could be. I, I hope to be completely wrong about this. I, I, wonder, I wonder if lots and lots of the other debate will be shut down around it. Um, now, uh, I'm going to be quite careful how I say something. I'm aware that some of the events leading up to it, some of the important science events, already are about how do we deliver net zero. You can't question whether net zero is appropriate. So already, in some of the academic community, some of the debates and some of the important events in the lead up to COP are already sort of uh, tailoring the message to align with net zero and COP. Um, and so... The way that I think COP can be, COP26 can be more successful is actually going to be deeply reliant on um, a civil society coming together in some sort of way, and I'm not saying the way of doing this, with, with academics with, with integrity, and that typically means younger academics, um, and other NGOs who are not, are, have not been sold, you know, not sold out to net zero. Some of them have, that I'm aware of, and some of them haven't. Um, and so I think if to COP, for COP to succeed, we need, we need to combine integrity with civil society movements those two coming together i think may be powerful enough to at least water down the uh, rhetorical uh, message of net zero which is basically you know better than we had before but still far removed from anything like the challenge we're trying to face um and so i'm at the moment i'm uncertain as to how cop 26 will play out also i just think from a pretty from another point of view physically having it in glasgow in in november i uh, talk about climate change it's not that serious an issue. Anyway, Glasgow in November is not going to be a warm place. But, but um, I do think, I think, I, I'm concerned about this net zero framing and that COP26 is about how do we, how do we fully embed that in, in governments, institutions, in organisations, in companies, and then we'll be locked into what is, uh, to me, is a deeply problematic sort of rhetoric for responding to climate change. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, Ben, you're up next. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks, Dan and Kevin, uh, for this opportunity to ask my question. <clears throat> this is Benny here from uh, Florida Department of Transportation. Uh, I mean, uh, concerning the fact that the, I just want to know that the first question I have, I guess, is that is there any specific correlations with the climate change and like hurricane activities? Because that's like one of the major problems that we have. Uh, Florida and uh, like uh, uh, protecting our infrastructure, especially transportation infrastructure, against uh, impact of hurricane activity. I wanted to know first whether there are any correlations with hurricane activity and climate change. Is there any like scientific studies that have like kind of uh, answered this question? And if so, and if we exceed like danger limits in terms of like. I don't know, two or three degrees of centigrade. Uh, uh, what impacts should be should we be expecting? How how what is the approach that we should adopt in designing a more resilient infrastructure that can withstand those changes? Thank you. Okay. Um, on the first, I mean, I'll, both of these are, are sort of pushing my area of expertise and pushing the envelope of it quite hard. On the hurricanes, my understanding of that. Um, it, which is basically taken from the IPCC, um, is, and I'm not, I'm not saying particularly about the ones in the US and Florida and so forth, but I mean, uh, certainly the ones in the tropics, 
uh, hurricanes, typhoons and so forth, that what we expect to see is an increase in the severity of those. So as we put more energy in the atmosphere, we expect to see the severity increase. Now, there was quite a concern for a while, saying that, not a concern, but there was an issue in the science, saying, well, do, do we expect to see more of them? And everyone thought we were going to see more of them. And, and a lot of time in, in the press and NGOs and lots of people said, we're going to see lots more hurricanes and so forth. But actually, the evidence was a bit uncertain about that. But I gather from the last few years, as we've got more data and better understanding of the, of, of the mechanisms behind these things, there's also um, a, a sort of a, a coming out of the science now that we're likely to see an increase in frequency and an increase in severity. Now, the severity has been there for quite a long time in the IPCC, but now there's some discussion about like to be an increase in, in frequency as well. Um, and that's that's important in parts like Florida and so forth, but if you look at some of the other parts of the world that only just about recover from each typhoon that they get, if you then get a small increase in frequency and a small increase in severity, it's not that they can stay static, they end up going backwards in those societies unless they can find ways to adapt to them. And they're pretty severe events to adapt to. So, um, so I think that, you know, the evidence suggests that we're going to see more extreme weather events around the planet and the empirical data um, is, is, is suggesting that as well but uh, uh, we mustn't overplay how much we see in the empiricism so far we've seen one degree centigrade of warming and that, that's what we're seeing with and we know we're going to see considerably more warming and we know that that will come with um, very likely sort of almost, probably not quite exponentially but more exponentially rising sets of impacts as the temperature goes up as we put more energy in the atmosphere we expect it to play out with more extreme weather events um, in terms of how we make our systems resilient, well, I think this comes back to my, almost my point earlier about sort of what's what's culturally appropriate for your, or, or in this case, what's physically appropriate. So how you would you respond in Florida will be how, very different from how you respond in Colorado, or how you respond in you know, New York will be different from how you respond in Delhi. So I think, you know, the, it will, it will the, the, a really important area of the science that I think we really need to sort of focus in on, but I think it's very poor at the moment, and we over, often overplay it, is actually the regional climate change we expect to see. There's loads of people that have made attempts to downscale global models to provide sort of, sometimes down to just a few kilometer grid squares, but I really think that, you know, it's an interesting scientific experiment doing that, but I don't think necessarily you get a lot of validity out of it. But I think we need to start to understand as best we can, what are the ranges we're likely to see as, as climate change gets worse in different parts of the world. So that gives those parts of the world a chance then to think about their infrastructure and how they can develop their infrastructure, which will be you know, geographically Climatically, uh, uh, has to be diff will be different to another part of the world, and so I don't think there's a clear way around that. How, how we respond, I think it's going to be place by place, depending on our geography, our socio economic conditions, who's living in those places, issues of other issues of vulnerability, is it agricultural areas, is it industrial area? So all those things play out when you think about issues of resilience um, and infrastructure, and it may, may well be in the end what we often have to. Well, what we may have to do, of course we have to do this to some extent anyway, and um, we may have to recognise that sometimes infrastructure will go down. So recognising it will go down was then, well, what do you do to make sure that you minimise the amount of hassle and damage and, and danger when it's down, and how fast, and how, what do you do to put it so it can get back up to speed very quickly? And I think the UK and Sweden is a good example. So we don't invest in much snow clearing equipment in the UK because we don't often that get that, that bad a winter. As soon as we do get a really bad winter, everyone moans we haven't got enough snow equipment. If we did have it, it would sit there hardly ever getting used for 20 or 30 years, and they can't be dragged out. As in Sweden, they can guarantee it sort of every year, what well, they have before climate change. Uh, every year, they're going to require their equipment. So again, it, I think we have to think about those sorts of things as well. How often do we expect these sort of extreme weather events to play out that would affect our infrastructure, and therefore that will respond, that will change how we, how we, we think of issues of resilience. Great, thank you. Yeah, there's so much to talk about that, actually. Um, so last but not least, uh, Dan, great to see you. Uh, what's your question for Kevin? Yeah, thanks, Dan. This has been uh, a great room, and kudos to you, uh, Kevin, for keeping us all enthralled uh, during this period. I've been on since the beginning, but I had to multitask a couple of times, and so if my question is redundant, just say so, and I'll uh, try and find out some other way. But lately, uh, um, I've focused a lot on and been critical of uh, the many corporate commitments that have been issued, as well as commitments at the, at the state or other entity level, and um, focusing on the fact that these round numbers are picked, and these round number dates are picked, and then there doesn't seem to be enough in between in terms of any type of system for uh, measuring, monitoring, and reporting and adjusting 
And so just to play out a hypothetical here, I mean, a company that's made a commitment by 2030 could, of course, do nothing in year one and then say, well, I'll make it up in year two. And then in year two, uh, they could say the same thing. And then as you get towards the end, they could say, well, we'll make it up with uh, you know, negative carbon technologies or we'll make it up with offsets or something like that. And I guess what I'm, I'm looking for from you is to help me understand how the models work in terms of these timelines and what happens on those timelines between year one and whatever date you're picking out in the future and and what the interaction is and what the scenario analysis is as you move forward does that make sense yeah it, it makes it makes sense and i think you're you're you're, you're um talking about a really important issue there um there's been a lot of emphasis now as i say and I don't, i'm not saying that all corporations are doing this or all, all councils or governments are doing this deliberately to be misleading but i think some of them some of them are um, is that they sort of focus on a date. We're going to be we're going to be net zero by 2035 or 2030 or 2050, whatever it might be, 80 percent reduction or something like that. Um, but with often, yeah, typically maybe some exceptions, but typically without any real plan of how they how they're going to get there. But also it misses something fundamental. Climate change is not an end point problem. Climate change is about the accumulation of emissions. And so what you do or don't do in year one, two, and three will have massive repercussions on what you need to do by year five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And I think that is actually missing. And it, to me, this has been a real problem in the UK, who actually, although I've disagreed with the Committee on Climate Change um, headline numbers, if you like, I strongly disagree. I think their, their reasoning before was, was good in terms of the overall framing. It seemed to be quite robust and scientific. It's now moved away from a, from a sort of total carbon budget framework for the UK. And now it's much more sort of about what's our highest possible ambition, which is a sort of language that's also locked into the legal dimension of, of Paris, from my understanding. And I think that's a really dangerous way of looking at it. Because the highest possible ambition is about, yeah, basically how can you push this, how far can you push the status quo? And we've got to go beyond that, way, way beyond it. And actually the budget framework tells us that. And so you can't just rely on what you'll have done by 2030. And as, as you say, often, by the time they get there, they'll just find, some people will just find some other ruse to find their way around it, or say, oh, it's take us a little bit longer. It's also worth bearing in mind that with a lot of companies, indeed with policymakers, they'll either be dead or retired by the time you get to 2030 or 2040 or 2050. And so, so they, they haven't really got that much commitment in there. Maybe we need to find some way that they or their family can be held to, you know, held financially to account for failing to deliver on the things they promised on in 2022. We, we, yeah, we need to find some way to hold people's feet to the fire. Um, and I think this is a concern that we've made about this net zero. It's, it's a really slippery slope in terms of anyone can say almost anything they want under the net zero umbrella. Um, and people say that's good because it's bringing people together. It sort of anchors similar views. But I think, it's a, to me, it's actually too sloppy a term. It's, it's, it's too dangerous. And it misunderstands the cumulative nature. The, you know, the cumulative nature of climate change says the most important period about reducing our emissions in line with Paris is what we do between now and 2030. Not what we do from 2030 onwards, it's actually what the emissions are today, tomorrow, the, the following year. Emissions are incredibly high and, and going up at a global level and, and actually from a, a, a barely coming down even in the wealthy countries when you look at our consumption emissions. And, and so I, I, I take your point, it's not good enough simply to have a sort of target for some year in the future. You've got a, a strategy for how to get there, you know, you've got not only have a strategy, you've got to know what are the numbers in the intervening years and you've got to have a mechanism for holding that company, that council, or that government to account. And in the UK, we do have to, we, the Committee on Climate Change does to some extent hold our government to account. So that is a bit of an example to use. Unfortunately, the account is very weak, in my view. But it seems like, you know, we would need some sort of annual feedback. And, yeah. you know, when you look at the IPCC reports or the, <clears throat> you know, the COP, uh, uh, you know, adjustment periods, which I think are five years, you know, that that's not set for an annual <coughs> feedback. I mean, is there something else that I don't know about in terms of how yeah. we're all going to get annual feedback? No, I think, I think you're spot on. I think the later we've left it, the more you need to speed the, the feedback to be quicker. I mean, if you start in 1990, you can have feedback every five or 10 years. That sounds fine. If you start in 2021, <laughs> you, I'm right. sorry, but by the, right. by the time you've got to 2022, you've squandered the last part of your budget. So you've got to have some very rapid feedback to say, well, where are we going on this? How are we moving on this? And I think this is what people misunderstand. If you've got to reduce emissions at 10% every single year, and the first year you only do 5%, then the following year you've got to be way above 10%. If the following year you only do 8%, you've now got to compensate for the 5% the first year, 
and the 2% you missed the year before, and you've got to do the 10% you're supposed to do that year as well. And I think people misunderstand it. A cumulative problem is fundamentally different from some just sort of random endpoint gesture. Okay, thanks for that, and, and thanks to you, Dan, for letting me come up. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you, everyone asking questions. By the way, Kevin, thank you. It's, we're in a little over two hours now, and we got through the audience question. I have a few more questions for you if you have a little bit more time. I, I don't want to... Yeah, yeah, fine by me, yeah. yeah. Take your way. I, I, my voice holds out. So, uh, so we talked... Um, uh, hold on a second. So we talked about uh, it's going to be very difficult to limit the warming, and we also talked about how the impacts of that warming are going to be catastrophic, I think is probably a safe word to use. Yeah. And in our pocket, we have a technology that we're pretty sure would work, although we're, you know, we don't know a lot, everything we need to know about it, and that's solar radiation management, or putting you know, the, you know, sulfur particles in, in the stratosphere to block part of the sun. And that yeah. would definitely, we know from volcanoes that that would actually reduce warming. So what are your thoughts on that technology and uh, its use in case things get really bad? Right, well, no, <laughs> I'm just thinking about some of my colleagues that I have, we have ongoing discussions about this sort of, what often referred to as geoengineering. I mean, initially all these yes. things came out of geoengineering, including negative emissions. Um, yes. So the, <laughs> there's a risk that if we research them, then we already start to embed them in our models because it's another it's another potential ruse that one of the other earlier questioners was um, talking about. There's another thing that we can use, another excuse that we can use. In fact, I think it might be new down the board about another reason we can use. But I think I don't think that's a good enough reason not to research these things. Um, so I think we should be looking at them. Um, I think we have to have really really strict sustainability criteria around them, and equity criteria, and issues of justice. So, yeah, solar radiation, all these things sound lovely in isolation. Remember that we can't even find ways. So when we leave a room, the lights switch off. Yeah, we always promise we've got technology to do this. We've got light switches. We've got all sorts of automated things. Walk around our cities, the lights are on. You know, across the board, we cannot, we cannot even apply basic technology to help us reduce our emissions. We fail at every single level, from the technology side, from the human interface side as well. So... Why do we suddenly assume that we're so clever at geoengineering the planet we can reliably do that? So well, I'm, we're doing that I well, we're doing that anyway, right? That, that's that's, what, that's yeah. what got us we're, in the mess. Yeah, we're doing, we're doing it. We are, but to assume that you can then actively go in and do it under some sort of controlled function, and the control is don't put the bloody emissions in the atmosphere, not carry on putting the emissions in the atmosphere and then have a go at spreading sulfates into the stratosphere where they, we don't understand the chemistry, the dynamics and so forth particularly well. You know, all the, you know, so we, as soon as you get to the stratosphere, things get quite complicated in the ways that we're still trying to learn about. You know, so it's really dangerous to doing that. I mean, how will that play out in some other parts of the world? Will it affect the monsoon conditions in parts of the world where people are relying on the monsoon conditions for farming? Are we going to do that as a test? Oh, look, what a shame. That community didn't get to grow its crops this year. And they're now, they're now fighting with the neighbours to get some food. I mean, so, so, you, so I just think it's inc we've got to be really careful about the incredible sets of dangers around these sorts of techniques. Now, if there's really simple ones, like, I don't know, you know having lighter colored roofs on our houses, yeah, great, let's try and do it if we can use the urban heat island effect or something. So it is about what set in place really stringent sustainability criteria, really sustainable, clear justice criteria, and, and think about the legal frameworks of this at the international level, and, and then play them out within that. But in absolutely, these things, these things should not be in any way, shape, or form factored into the, the rates of mitigation that we, we require today. They are, again, a separate entity to this. And, and, and some of the ones we may well make the situation worse. That's why I said this, the sustainability criteria are probably some of the first things we need to really think about. You know, what, are the, what are the implications of, that, that we must avoid by doing these things? Yeah, but I think we have to look at them. And by the way, we, we, we've had other rooms on this, but uh, it's, it's like chemotherapy. Yes, you can say a lot of bad things about you're going to get you sick, it might kill you, you lose your hair. But you do it only when you think the the risks are less than the risk of not doing it. I think and, that's but, true. We've got to be quite careful about it. Like we're going to be there. Yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, the chemotherapy example. Like most examples they sort of work because it's, I choose chemotherapy for me. But in this particular case, I'm going to choose this chemotherapy for other people elsewhere in the world. So it's um, we've got to be. It's not these are like analog, like all analogies and metaphors. They work to a point, then they break down, and they're not they're not directly comparable here. So we're applying this thing to to you know what. What do indigenous people in certain parts of the world, what's their say on this? Do they get a say in whether we, whether, whether we practice these experiments at the global level or not? 
that they probably haven't caused any emissions in the first place. So the high emitters get to choose the global experiments we carry out. And if they go wrong, hey, Preston, we've got enough money and resources to probably survive through it. So I, we have to be very, very careful about that. Yeah, I think... Oh, yeah, no, I agree with yeah. that. But, yeah. but anyway, I want to ask you a kind of... By the way, I realize that I missed uh, Glenn down there because I, I you were off the screen as the last person up, up there for questions. So, Glenn, if you're still there, please ask your question. Kevin. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Kevin. Um, Hi, Glenn. Sorry, my signal's a bit, a bit thing. I'm coming in from a slightly different angle. Sorry, I had to um, I had to come out of the conversation because I had a meeting, so I've just come in. So you haven't missed me out at all, um, Dan, but thank you. Um, uh, just, just looking at the figures, you I, right at the beginning of the room, you were talking about agriculture and uh, emissions, which I get completely. But um, I was just doing sort of like some back of car calculations here. Um, if Regen Ag sequesters 10 tons per hectare per year, and this is um, information coming from uh, Professor Do Dr. Johnson or David Johnson and Professor Ratan Lau, who are two really um, big names in, in soil science um, and that's also backed up in farms with the likes of Gabe Brown and others. If yep. the UK has 9 million hectares um, in agricultural production um, surely if just policy um, you know the policy changes from you know sort of like a, a capitalist uh, system to a regenerative um, a, a, a regenerative capitalism and um, agricultural changed as well to regenerative agriculture um, Surely we could we could do this. We could get to net zero quite easily by 2030, just through the, the amount of land that's in agriculture in the UK for the UK. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to say too much about this because it's not my realm. But I, I hear this quite often. It's, it's something along these sorts of lines. I've heard a lot. And as an engineer who's used to sort of like uncertainties of um, you know, just a few percent, when you look at it, sort of a lot of the engineering things that, that I've traditionally looked at, where you look at things like agriculture and you look, you look at um, ecological systems, the, the, the error bars are just enormous. So there's a really interesting paper in, uh, out, uh, there were two papers actually out on soil, I think, about a year, uh, maybe two years ago now, and one might have been three years ago. And it was just looking at the um, emissions from soil with, with, with warming. And I mean, the, the, the levels of emissions were absolutely huge, but what, so ignoring that part of the moment, it was actually the error bars on it were astronomical. It's because it's a much, much more complicated system than, you know, than, than an internal combustion engine of the car or an electric motor, which is something we, which is, you know, we, we, so we sort of reductionist, we can look at those things and say, they say things quite precisely about them. I'm really suspicious about, about it, at precise numbers on um, sort of biological systems, when when the data that I see has these huge bar, error bars on it, and what happens if, for instance, we ch the rainfall patterns change? So you've done something, and because of climate change or whatever it might be, but probably because of climate change, we see changes in the rainfall patterns. Does that change how the soil responds? Does it change how the types of plants that we put in place respond? Which is why I don't like the substitution between between things like regenerative ag agriculture. Yes, we can expand the airport. We just know straight away that's what's going to happen, and so. Um, and that's happening in Sweden with our land, with the Arlanda Airport. We're going to plant trees in the north of Sweden so that we can expand Arlanda Airport. Um, and, and yet, you know, a tree sequestering in 2030 and 2040 is not the same thing. A ton sequestered then is not the same thing as a ton emitted from a plane today from Arlanda Airport. They're different things, different time frames, different discount frameworks around and different uncertainties. And so, yes, I'm pleased that you should be pursuing the sort of things you're pursuing and I, and I appreciate the arguments you're making, but I think the uncertainties are so large that we cannot rely on that to say we can solve all this problem relatively easily by 2030. I just think that's, in, I actually almost go as far as I think that language is almost quite dangerous. Let's do those things, but let's not use those to say this is a relatively simple problem. Let's not use those to allow us to carry on emitting elsewhere, which of course, if it is a substitute, in theory, you can. But I would argue it's not a substitute. They're not, they're not, they're not the same thing. Well, can I come that's back to you a little bit on that? Just okay. a little bit. Um, the, so the whole uh, regenerative capitalism is based around um, the UN SDGs, which um, are all highlighted by in harmony, in harmony with nature. So if, if, if um, the whole capitalist system changed to a regenerative capitalism, where every decision was actually made in harmony with nature, um, then that would actually change the investment portfolios of every business. If agriculture moved into a regenerative, I'm not talking about agroforestry, I'm talking about agriculture growing food yeah. into a regenerative system. And, um, you know, they're using the UN's five sustainable development goals, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the uh, five yeah. soil health principles, which are all linked into the development goals. In other words, they're protecting the carbon that, are, that is in the soil 
that um, plants can draw out of the atmosphere and put into the soil and not letting it go. Soil is the biggest store of carbon we know or we have yep. agency over and we can, we can do it. But it's just a matter of tying up both the um, the capitalist, you know, the, the, the business side, the regenerative business side and re- regenerative agriculture. It's just the thought. Well, no, as I say, I'm not, I'm not trying to oppose what you're suggesting. What I'm saying is, what happens if the temperature in the UK goes up significantly? What happens if we lose the Gulf Stream and the temperature drops significantly? How do the estimates we know around soil change? I, I, as I understand it, it could change quite significantly. And I, but I'm, overall, I'm sort of agreeing with what you're saying. But I think the language of sort of saying we can do this sort of thing does allow us that substitution. So if you can solve it with this, why would you bother trying to say reduce the amount of um, aviation or cut back on the size of our cars? Why would you bother doing that? Um, you, I, and I think there's a real risk, and that is what happens. Every time something's in there that allows us to, to sort of maintain business as usual, we'll use it and misuse it. Um, so let's pursue these things. I think there's lots of uncertainties in there still. Um, I appreciate what you're saying. And I say you know more about it than I do, but I'd be reluctant to say this is, a, this is something that allows us to substitute between um, areas. And just on the SDGs, one of the SDGs has in it economic growth. Of course it does. We couldn't possibly think of a world without economic growth going on forever. Infinite economic growth on a round planet. Jessica Rogan had this stuff nailed years ago in thermodynamics, but anyway. But, um, so we, the SDGs themselves, you know, we have to be careful about how they were constructed, who constructed them, and you know, what's in them. So there are, they don't necessarily mean if we meet the SDGs that we, we, meet, we meet sustainability criteria, certainly not with, the, with economic growth in there. So, so you're bringing up something that I had a question about, uh, well, I, that's something I talk about, and that is that, in fact, we're using tree planting as sequestering carbon. And but we're relying on that. Uh, you know, the, the system problem we have is that we took carbon that was not in the biosphere. We dug holes in the ground, we burned it as fast as we possibly could, and we put it in the atmosphere in the biosphere. Um, and turning it back into carbon that's in solid form in the biosphere, I, I don't think helps because that that carbon is going to turn back into CO two at the worst possible time due to flood, drought, wildfire, disease, bark beetle, heat stress, etc. And so it's not just a temporal problem with, you know, a, a ton captured, you know, 20 years from now is not the same as one emitted today. But it's not permanent either. Uh, you no, no, I, 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 I would sort of agree with you, except for that. I, I mean, I, I said something years ago, so I got, got requoted over and over again. It was a really silly thing. I just said, you know, plant trees for good tree reasons. <laughs> Don't plant them for carbon reasons. You know, you plant trees because they're good for biodiversity, for they're good for you know, a whole set. Yeah. There's lots of wonderful, I'm surrounded here by lots of trees. Now, there's lots of wonderful reasons to plant trees. But don't plant trees because you want to absorb carbon so you can carry on doing some other activity elsewhere. And worse still, don't plant trees then burn them in your bloody power stations. I mean, sort of, uh, and, you know, it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's like some sort of ancient form of engineering dragged out into the 21st century as if that's going to help us solve climate. I mean, it's almost embarrassing. I, as an engineer, I, I do find it embarrassing. I often say this. That, are, you know, that virtually all of the models assume hundreds of billions of tons of CO2 and energy production, uh, CO2 absorption and energy production by growing plants and burning them in power stations. I mean, is, is that what we've come to in terms of engineering in 2021? <laughs> so, yes, let's okay. grow lots of trees. Let's think about biodiversity. Let's think about those other really important sustainability issues, which are absolutely key. In fact, the Glyn was sort of talking to about those in terms of food production and so forth. You know, we, we need to be really careful about the other side of things. The problem with carbon and the problem with climate, it almost dominates. So you know, we've got to be really careful that we don't use that and forget that it's just part of a whole systemic set of issues that are coming out of our misuse of the place where we live. And that misuse... Although it's been going on for, for um, centuries with humankind, but actually the, the acceleration, we can't, just, you know, we can't all blame the Iron Age for what's gone on. We, we, you know, the acceleration has been in, in you know, the post-war acceleration, certainly post-First World War, post-Enlightenment acceleration. Um, and and we, have to, we have to think of climate change in that suite of challenges that our, that our, that our trajectory is imposing upon our own home. Well, by the way, I agree with you. On all of that. Uh, that, that. So let me ask you sort of a final question. We've been going on for a long time here, so I really appreciate your time. Uh, but I'm going to give you a chance to kind of sum up sort of everything oh, you've been talking about in a way uh, by asking you the following question. Okay, so now you're king of the world or king of COP or you're king of the, you know, you're the, 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 all the government. So you get to dictate what we do starting right now uh, in, in terms of whatever, you know, uh, what... What steps would you take right away or would you recommend that the world take right away to move towards the right kind of future? Right, because you're describing it as right away, what, what we have to do is we have to get the emissions out of the system immediately. 
And we can't get all of the missions out, but if we don't get a large part of the missions out straight away, we fail. So yes, we can rely on the technology and so forth in the future. They're really important. Um, but we cannot make all those changes in the next year, two years or three years. But what we can change, and it will be, I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm king of the world, maybe I can impose this, but I'm not too keen on that as a, as a form of, uh, as, as a form of coercive policy. Um, but what we can change is, is, is the inequality in the world and the behavior of us high emitters. So if we're going to respond to climate change, you're telling me what do we have to do immediately? It's get the emissions out of the high emitters. Now, there are, and I don't think there's a single way of doing that. So my headline framing, if we're serious about climate change, is we need the cops, we need the international negotiations to be honest. And that basically means, go back to my comment on rationing earlier, we've got a global carbon budget with a, with a reasonable degree of uncertainty. It could be 20% bigger or 20% smaller, whatever. But we've got a pretty good handle on that, which we can get from the IPCC for 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. We then say that's got to be divided amongst the world. That's a, that's a, that's a hell of a poker game or a big, a big wrestling match one way or the other. But we have to do that. There's no neat way out of that. We've got to stay in that budget. Um, so we need to do that as quick as possible. And once the budgets are allocated to countries through that negotiating process, and everyone, of course, is going to try and make the best for them. And once that's done, I think what we do in each country is up to that country. It can use a carbon tax. It can use a fee and dividend. It can use stringent regulation. It can give all the, all the emissions to the, to the wealthy people and the poor people can die. It can do whatever it wants in its own, in its own, within its own remit. That's its country's decision to do that with its citizens. But we have to make that first step recognise, firstly, we have a budget, if we want to stick to the commitments we've made, we've got to divide the budget up, and then each country will use, choose its most culturally appropriate ways of looking at that. But each country, the emissions will be, with them, probably with very few exceptions, the emissions will be highly skewed towards the high emitters in that country. And so if they're going to succeed to say in their, within their own national budget, they're going to have to address the high emitters in that country. Um, and so that's, that's the framework that gets you the early emission hits. I'm not saying any of this is likely. All I'm simply saying, if, if we are to deliver on our 1.5 to 2 degrees commitment, I can see no alternative but that sort of framing. That won't solve the problem. We need the technologies and so forth as well. But it makes the early big hit wins in terms of getting our emissions out of the system. And that's the bit we're reluctant to do because that's the bit that, you know, we, the people making those policies are the high, are us, are the high emitters. So, so, so I think I that's I've heard you mind. talk about uh, about this before, and I think you were talking about that half of. The, can you talk a little bit about how it's so skewed towards the high emitter? Like fifty percent of the emissions come from what percent of the population? Yeah, about, yeah I was saying this earlier. About fifty percent of global emissions come from the activities of about ten percent of the world's population. So, and, and, and wow. about the top, the top one percent of emitters globally have um, total emissions that are the equivalent to twice the bottom fifty percent. Does that? Now that I think is. A, a, Completely twice the bottom. Wait, wait, wait. Twice yeah, the yeah, exactly that. Twice the bottom fifty percent. The top one percent of emissions. There's a piece of paper out by Sivan Carter and others in the Stockholm Environment Institute. And the top one percent of emitters have emissions that are yeah, approximately twice that of the bottom fifty percent of global emitters. Remember, if you look at Kenya, wow. Kenya's average emissions territorially are about 0.3 tons per person. The states are somewhere between 16 and 18 tons. Yeah, and then I mean that's an average for the states. There'd be loads of people in the states that'd be way, way below that average. I mean, by definition, most people are below the average of a country because the average is pushed up by the high emitters. So there'll be people in the States who are on the, on the 200 to 300 tonnes per person bracket. And then you've got people in the States who will probably be on the two tonnes or three tonnes per person bracket. So even in the States, you see these massively skewed differences. Um, and, and, and that, to me, is a bit that we that almost across the academic realm we've not been prepared to address. It. Some more recent work has done some really wonderful stuff on this to show, to sort of pull this out. But, um, but the problem with it is it has huge political repercussions. So we, by and large, we don't like to have to address those sorts of sets of issues because we're, we're not courageous enough to do it. Do you we, think, we prefer, the, do you yeah. think that the, this, there's a, something starting where, you know, people would put solar panels if you were wealthy because solar panels, people, you know, when they talk about, well, we can't rely on new technology, point out that low cost solar is a very new technology. It's only been around for like five years. It used to be yeah. high cost solar, and but used to do it just to show off that, you know, that, uh, that you know, the, you're trying to watch the environment. Um, but if we, do you think that's possible that, I don't know, socially, that if you're a wealthy person that you must have zero emissions on net, and then I, I, we have to talk about net again, uh, would, would have an impact? Let's say social. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I think I think it's really important for the, you know, if you've got the wherewithal, yeah, put it to something worthwhile. 
Um, but the problem is, if you do not use that to compensate for other things that we're doing. So yes, if you've got, if we are, you know, put, put the solar panels in the house and let's try and drive these, drive these technology markets that are low emissions. But let's not pretend that will solve the problem in the time frame that we have. It won't. And the, and the right. problem with those of us that are wealthy, we we are trying to reconcile the irreconcilable. You know, we cannot so carry on with our lifestyles. <laughs> so you know, you may put solar panels on on the roof, but then what about the double door refrigerator inside? Where do the resources come from there? How much energy was used to make the chassis of this, the steel chassis that went into the into the refrigerator? You know, and the, the huge three ton car that sat out there, that's an EV car now powered partly, only very partly, by our local solar panels. You know, where did that, all that steel come from? Where did all the lead come from the battery or for the lithium if it's a if it's an EV battery? So you know, across the board. That if we're high consumers, we are consuming lots and lots of um, energy, lots of resources, and emitting lots of carbon. Even if our roof is full of solar panels and a big wind turbine blatting away behind it, you know, we can't escape the fact is that high levels, high high levels of consumption and energy cannot be reconciled with our Paris Agreement and so forth. We can go back to mes- mes- you know, massive levels of inequality if we want to. If we if we solve climate change and we solve the broader sustainability criteria, you know. We can all make our different arguments of whether huge levels of inequality and, and deep, deep, deep poverty are reasonable or not. I think I don't like that, that view of the, I don't like that framing of the world or that we have those inequalities, but other people think it's fine. Um, we can argue that politically later. In the interim, regardless of the moral arguments for that, one way or another, the, the, the science tells us if we to live in our commitments, you cannot have the very wealthy simply finding ways of buying them their way out of it with technology, bits of kit, a bit of offsetting, and some biofuel for their private planes or their large limo in the garden, in the, or, or four-wheel drive or SUV. We can't do that. The maths just don't play it out, regardless of the moral question. And we don't like that. You know, those of us who are wealthy simply don't like that. We turn away. It's all communist nonsense. It's all socialist nonsense. It's just the bloody maths. Yeah. Don't sign up to the commitments unless we are prepared to commit to them. Yeah, you know, we didn't say we'll try and you know, we, I'll try and pick my child up after school. We don't say that. We'll pick the child up after school. Hopefully not by not by you know, we're going to pick them up and walk home with them rather than in the car. You know, so it's a commitment we've made, it's an obligation we made to other people elsewhere, to future generations and, and I suppose between us and the and the world in which we live. We've made these obligations. Let's if we if we're serious about them, then the maths tell us the sorts of scale of change we require. And let's not hide behind some dislike of a particular form of politics or another form of politics as an excuse for inaction. And that's what we've done so far for 20 to 30 years. Well, with, with, with that philosophy of Yoda, which is uh, there is do it or don't do it, but there's no try. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I want to thank you so much for spending two and a half hours uh, with us, uh, with the, basically the largest room we've had here on the club so far. And people have stayed on the entire time listening it's been a fascinating discussion. I promised people that they would hear kind of the raw, real story uh, without being sugarcoated. I think we definitely got that. I've been I've been learning from your insights for a really long time. In fact, I've been listening to you so long. I feel like I, I, I've known you like personally for a long time, even though we just basically met very recently. And uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, be, be in this discussion with you. And I also want to... Uh, leave um, an open invitation to come back, especially maybe around the next COP or something where we could have a little discussion about what's going on there and, and give people a chance to connect with you on, on Clubhouse, which is uh, um, an interesting, I think, a platform. This is very ethereal, by the way. We're not recording. There'd be people who were on today at the benefit of this discussion. Maybe next time we'll figure out some other technologies, maybe stream it on YouTube or things like that. But uh, yeah. it's, it's been a great, great discussion. I really appreciate your time today. Any any um, final thoughts, anything that we didn't cover that you think people should be thinking about or watching out for before we yeah, go? I, well, that's right. I, mean, I would just like to say, yeah, thank, first, firstly, thanks to all those people that are still are still hanging on and, and presumably some of them, some of them hopefully at least, at least are listening. Thanks to you for organising it. Um, and it's great to see these sorts of discussions going on. We don't have to agree with each other. In fact, it's more interesting when we don't. And then we unpick, courteously unpick each other's views to try to, try to all of us, try to get a better understanding of the challenges that we face. Um, so it's great to have these sorts of these sorts of open-ended discussions that actually have a fairly um, open-ended time frame as well. I think that's really important. So often we try to rush complicated issues into very short periods of time, and, and, and therefore we come up with unhelpful answers, I think. So I think this sort of dialogue is, is really important. Um, and, to, and I think probably finally to recognise that there are no experts out there in terms of they know exactly what we need to do. We, we all have a role to play in this because we're, we're all partly sort of fumbling along in the dark because the challenge is so absolutely huge. So you know, never despair and think, what, what can you do? 
you know, thinking about things, trying to make changes yourself, talking to your friends and family, engaging with the political cycle is really important. And I think actually in democracies, we don't do that enough. But uh, there are plenty of things that we can all engage with one way or another. Um, and the views that you might have may be just as important as the views of a great and good person or a professor or a policymaker or whoever. So um, you know, you know, we, we, all, we all have the potential to help catalyze change. I totally agree with I, that. I I mean, the, I, yeah, Stacey, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to thank you, Kevin, because at, at the beginning of the conversation, honestly, I was thinking, I was so hopeless that I was thinking about um, self-immolation is probably the best <laughs> course of action for me, but then how carbon unfriendly that would be to the environment. And, it's carbon um, neutral. But, it is carbon, but now I'm, I'm so energized um, that there's someone that sounds is just simply brilliant. And... Um, speaking with uh, passion on this topic um, and is it might even be further um, uh, 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 gone than me in terms of what we need to do and how quickly we need to do it um, that it, I'm just I'm delighted I'm uh, thank you thank you so much for being here and for talking to all of us and yeah I, I seriously I want to bottle you up and and just spread you everywhere because we need more of this. We really, really do. I think a lot of people would like to have me bottled, bottled up and never released them. <laughs> bottled up, that's true. Um, and uh, back to what you were saying, Kevin, about what everyone can do. I totally agree. In fact, uh, you know, I have a TEDx talk on carbon pricing that's in my bio. And, you know, what's my call to action? My call to action is to talk to everybody you know about this. Yeah. Talk to your friends, family, colleagues, especially your elected leaders. Tell them about the problem of climate change. Tell them there are solutions that we, you know, like carbon pricing, for example, that would, you know, get us moving in the right direction. And tell them we have to do it right now. And I think if everyone demands action, and I think we're starting, you know, kind of what we're starting to see, partly because of the impacts and whatever, um, that's that's a key thing. It's it's the bedrock of, of, of action is getting the, the public engaged and demanding action. So, so yeah. I agree with you on that. So um, with that, um, thank you again, Kevin. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone in the audience uh, and all the spe uh, people who ask questions. It's been a fantastic discussion. And I continue to learn things, Kevin, every time I listen to you. And so I appreciate that. And again, I really appreciate how um, direct you are about it because it's so important to really understand the situation we're in so we can do something about it. So yeah. thank you, right. everybody. That concludes our interview with climate scientist Kevin Anderson. To listen to other Climate Chat Club interviews, search for Climate Chat Club on YouTube. Thank you for listening.